submit all. I'm just gonna turn the waiting room off. Okay, um, welcome. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a conversation between Something Fantastic and Oana Stanescu. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kyle Miller. I'm an associate professor here at Syracuse Architecture and I'll be hosting the event tonight. Um, let me also now mention that if you'd like to enable the closed captioning, you can simply click the closed caption button. Uh, or I think if you're on a Mac to the right of the button on the bottom of the Zoom interface and click show subtitles. Um, thank you to Jessica for providing the captions tonight. Um, to begin, I'd like to introduce uh, Elena Schutz, uh, Julian Schubert and Leonard Streich uh, together, something fantastic, a design practice which began in Berlin in 2010. Their work spans across uh, art direction, graphic design, um, mostly books. Um, and spatial design, lots of installations and exhibitions, um, as well as is developed in tandem with their teaching. Um, from 2012 to 2019, uh, Elena, Julian, and Leonard taught in the postgraduate program on urban design at the ETH in Zurich and are now directing, I think as of last year, the Studio for Intermediate Spaces um, at the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. Um, exploring, and I quote, the potentials of post-disciplinary spatial practices in the light of ecological and social crises. Um, the notion of design not only existing in a post-disciplinary realm, but also in relation to crisis uh, is a condition something fantastic seems to always have embraced. Uh, first, upon beginning their practice in 2010, just after the financial crisis, um, at a moment when many design disciplines were asking big questions, about the role of design in the built environment and in relation to unstable economic and financial structures, uh, traditional architectural practice was called into question, um, uh, really globally, I think. Um, and at that time, Elena, Julian, and Leonard were focused on establishing a practice um, that really consciously and aggressively worked through these larger questions and conversations. Um, it's an approach to practice that began for them um, with the publication of a manifesto uh, I believe in 2009, and is still um, very evident in their efforts today as designers and educators. Uh, Oana Stanescu also joins us this afternoon, I should say this evening for them. Um, originally from Romania, Oana is an architect and designer who splits her time between New York and Berlin. They are all currently in Berlin in the same room as you see, um, and while completing projects across the globe, including the Plus Pool, uh, a floating water filtering swimming pool in the East River, um, as well as a wide range of collaborations with Nike, MoMA, Virgil Abloh, Storefront for Art and Architecture, and many more. Um, when Oana was here last semester, I shared my appreciation with her comfort um, navigating the blurry boundaries between unique design disciplines. Um, I also mentioned that Oana is one of a handful of individuals that I think is actively redesigning the role of the architect today. Um, someone that's not necessarily a singular visionary, but really a, a team member. Uh, and one among many um, in a team in a temporary global collaboration that um, can solidify when necessary and really wherever needed. Um, and this afternoon, we'll witness one of these collaborations um, in which I think the aspirations of each of the four of them are, are really complementary to one another and, and seem to come into alignment. Um, this collaboration will extend beyond tonight's event. Uh, the performance that um, Elena, Julian, and Leonard and Oana prepared for us today will also serve as the beginning of a design workshop. So tomorrow morning, the four of them will meet with a handful of first year uh, architecture students to begin a three week design workshop, investigating covers in art, architecture, film, and music. I'm very excited to see the results. I'm a bit jealous that I can't participate as a student, although maybe I can sneak in. Um, I should also mention that tonight's event is supported by our school's Dylan Back Endowment which was established in memory of Elsie Dillenbach, who was hired by Syracuse University in 1943 as a professor and the director of architecture. Um, and they're in very good company. Past Dillenbach lecturers include Charles Moore, Michael Graves, Toshiko Mori, Juppé, Rodolfo Machado, Barbara Bester, and many others. Lastly, um, regarding the format 
for the event. Um, of course, I ask that you all remain uh, muted. Um, there'll be a time at the end if you'd like to chime in where it will be appropriate to unmute yourself. Um, I'll, soon I'll soon hand it over to the guests and after their presentation, we can, as I just mentioned, open it up to questions from everyone else. Um, so at that time, if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the raise hand function, which I think is now accessible in the reactions tab on the bottom of the screen. Um, or you can simply type your question in the chat room and I can ask the question for you. Um, okay, uh, I think we're in for a treat tonight. Oana, Elena, Julian, and Leonard, welcome. Thank you for spending time with us. It's all yours. Sweet. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, for the great introduction and Michael for having us. All right, let's do this. Sorry for the slight. Uh, all right. So, as you just heard, it is the lecture is is the kickoff for for a workshop um, uh, in which we want to uh, explore uh, covers. And tonight we will we will um, show you a set of of covers in a rather loose manner to kind of um, open up the realm uh, uh, for the coming workshop. Um, five quick points um, on on covers. Uh, why we think it makes some more sense to to use it as a or look into it as a design technique. First of all, if you if you look very carefully at what people have done that come before, if you actually go so deep that you try to cover it. Most likely, if it's a good thing, it's an humbling experience, and you and you and you uh, discover <coughs> uh, the greatness of it. Um, it increases the chances of a good result. And um, uh, Christopher Alexander explained that in in, uh, in the uh, book synthesis of form in a very nice way. How how in vernacular architecture, basically through repetition, um, yeah. In the end, the end result is usually good. Um, and of course, architecture, design, fashion, um, it always has the human body uh, as a scale in the end. And I mean, we vary a little bit, but we don't vary that much. So it's good to know what, what works out. Um, fourth, we are embedded in context anyhow. Um, and it's somehow nearly unavoidable to copy it that good or make such a great cover that, that uh, your own mark won't be felt anyhow. And finally, in the long run, we're all dead. Um, so let's use our time efficiently. <laughs> Two quick quotes that, quotes that illustrate that. One is from Coco Chanel that says, only those with no memory insist on their originality. There's a second quote, uh, which is a quote from by On Borges uh, from a lecture at uh, Harvard in 68, 67 minutes. He says, all originality is nothing but oblivion. So the funny thing is who these quotes are attributed to is also very vague. You're going to realize a quote that's attributed to Coco is attributed to many other people. And Borges is actually quoting Franz Bacon. So I think there's also something interesting about the weight of these quotes they have that come simply through the attribution to these characters that we actually consider rather as originals in the first place. So I think there's a interesting play there to begin with. There's another quote from Voltaire, and he says that originality is nothing but judicious imitation. So I think those set the tone quite well with regards to um, the premise of the workshop and some of the points they were trying to make with some of these quotes. And one of the first ones that came to mind in, uh, for me when we started thinking of quotes was this cover by Cat Power of the I Can Get No Satisfaction song by Rolling Stones. Less 
So one thing that always kind of drove me mad, but in the best in the best uh, kind of way is she doesn't say the damn song. She just doesn't say the chorus. She never says, I can get no satisfaction. And when you listen to the song, you still recognize the song. You know it's that song, but she never says it. And I think it even takes people a while to realize that she actually doesn't say the songs, the, the words and the title and the chorus. So the fact that she's able to transmit the feeling of the original song, while it sounds radically different and without the actual words, that's kind of pretty freaking magic, if you ask me. Here we have um, a cover of Stool 60 by Advalalto, which is um, yeah, the most successful piece of furniture that uh, the modern, modernist movement somehow made. The interesting thing about this one by Aro Frick, which is from 2018, is that it somehow <clears throat> just uses acrylic glass um, instead of wood. Uh, and in a way, it feels like it's the natural material for that chair, because actually, in order to, to, to be able to bend the wood as, as Alvarado did in his chair, he somehow had to invent all new technique of cutting up the, uh, the wood, etc. Whereas acrylic glass, which actually was invented more or less at the same time as, as Alvarez invented the chair, just has that as its normal properties. Um, second one is, is a cover of, of the Barcelona Pavilion by Miss van der Rohe done by Orme for an exhibition at the Triennale in 1985, <laughs> where I guess also triggered by the form of the Triennale, but um, also in the larger sense that, that they uh, somehow wanted uh, to break the case for modernism uh, uh, and the possibility of what can unfold in, 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 in the modern space, they somehow bent the whole thing. Here's, here's a, like a very German example, which if, if you were, let's say, above the age of seven uh, in 1987, or even, uh, even, even a little bit less, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you definitely know this image, which is of uh, Uwe Barschel, uh, a German politician who was found dead uh, in a Geneva hotel in his bathtub. And Thomas Demand, a German, German artist, um, uh, builds images usually that are, has this one kind of part of, 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 of a, uh, a general consciousness, let's say, uh, as a model takes the picture uh, and uh, yeah, somehow uh, captures it a second time, let's say. Um, the next example is a rather um, uh, uncommon one in this uh, series because, as you can see, uh, we took to express uh, what we wanted to show you. Uh, we are showing the same picture on both sides. And the reason for that is um, uh, that the film soundtrack of A Space Odyssey by Sandy Kubrick in 1968. Um, has um, like, first of all, an, an outstanding uh, and uh, quite famous um, soundtrack. And uh, the way uh, it came, or especially the most known parts came into being was that um, usually when you, when you cut a movie, um, what you do when, this, obviously the soundtrack is not done when you're cutting the movie. So what you're usually doing is that you're using other movies, existing movies, film music, or other classical existing uh, pieces to just get the right impression while you're working on the movie. And these tracks are uh, called temp tracks. And what's then usually done is that the actual composer of the, of the movie is kind of recomposing um, 
the, the actual final film music, but kind of following um, uh, these temp tracks. And in the case of, uh, of Space Odyssey, Kubrick in some uh, scenes liked the temp tracks that were all quite known uh, classical music pieces. He liked them so much that he decided that he would keep them in the final um, movie. And I'm showing you one of the most famous scenes now. Stopping here. Um, and actually, um, this scene has become so famous that I'm going to show you another cover of, of this. Awesome. I'll take care of this. <laughs> oh, another cover um, would be uh, maybe this this chair. Uh, so now looking at furniture, this uh, chair um, by Ilmari Tapiovara, which is referencing a kind of a vernacular chair uh, from Congo that he got as a present in the 1950s, and Ilmari. Tapiovara, a Finnish uh, designer, liked so much the, the workings of the chair with those two, um, uh, um, like uh, uh, the back and the, the seat, seat uh, um, kind of um, stuck into each other without any uh, joints, but through only through the mechanics um, holding together. And then it also became somehow a camping or it's like, it's, it's a very practical uh, thing, but it's clearly also still showing the reference and has since then been um, adapted a lot. There's another example um, we like a lot, which is um, uh, Lina Bobardi and her uh, and the chair that she found um, as the story uh, says in a, on a bus stop in Bahia in, in Brazil. Um, where people would uh, just take three sticks, wooden sticks, and um, tie them together and then create a, a seat out of that, which then she often used, or she also made a chair with the same kind of um, peculiar uh, um, uh, working. Um, and then if we now, oh. <laughs> Fashion. <laughs> <laughs> um, fashion example. Um, the uh, Japanese uh, Yika Tabi worker boots um, that were that are um, kind of a, um, a follow uh, follow up of original um, toe uh, uh, socks that again uh, came from the fact that traditional Japanese thong shoes would only work uh, with um, toe socks, but have uh, since like the 1900s become uh, a common um, shoe for workers, um, uh, for gardeners in Japan um, have become um, or were covered by uh, Maison Martin Margiela um, since 1988 and have um, in the last 30 years been part of uh, every uh, collection and they feature um, they uh, either like in, in uh, women's wear or in men's wear with heels or no heels, different materials, but there's always this like reoccurring um, uh, theme of the split toe.
Um, he, here we have um, a kind of a quite direct cover, you could say. Um, the Glasgow Airport identity from 1964, uh, Margaret Calvert, and uh, the off-white logo from Virgil Abloh. Um, the nice thing is, in a way, uh, Virgil salvaged the logo, one could say, because uh, actually the Glasgow Airport, for instead of having this beautiful arrow that somehow points both inwards and outwards uh, was worthy of replacement by this. <clears throat> so I think it's somehow an interesting example, especially also if you take, if you read into Virgil's show notes of, of, of the recent show, um, there's a little essay who says who, who, who did it first and, and there's no, there's my, <clears throat> another chapter on called the upcycling ideology, um, which kind of uh, um, questions, let's say fashions, um, uh, a hunger for, for the new um, and advocates somehow uh, upcycling both ideas you had uh, before, um, as well as actually just using trying to sell garments you did before again. Um, and the logo somehow, yeah, one could say is, is uh, luckily was picked up again by Virgil. <clears throat> Another fashion example, um, Coco Chanel's um, Chanel costume or like the, the jacket um, that, is, a, is one of the key uh, features of, of the brand um, ever since. And that um, has been um, re-edited um, and re-edited and covered and covered again uh, by Karl Lagerfeld um, in every, basically in every collection um, uh, that we've seen on, um, of Chanel. Uh, during his long um, engagement as a designer. Some architecture <laughs> for a change. Finally. Finally, finally. On the left, Mr. Wies, uh, with the Seagram building. What's interesting, um, actually, we actually misspelled the name on upper right, but basically uh, Robert Walker was a student at IIT, so he's an Irish architect and who went to study to IIT didn't work directly under Mies, but was so uh, influenced by him that when he went back to Ireland and worked for Scott Talon Walker, he one of his creations was the bike, uh, Bank of Ireland in uh, headquarters in downtown Dublin, which uh, funnily enough ended up being, it's a complete, in a way, homage to Mies. It's uh, so much so that it ended up being called the Miesian Plaza although Mies was not directly involved in any way, yet it made for a really cool, spectacular uh, uh, space that still uh, thrives today. Which brings us to another kind of, let's say, direct cover, just as, as uh, the Miesian Plaza and also the Chanel costume somehow is, is a constant theme that is somehow being uh, worked on. Uh, here's a, is the first project by us actually, which uh, is a cover of Maison d'Habitation Economique by La Cateau from 1992, which, which was never really built like that, but of course they did build uh, several others. And one of the first houses we worked on was uh, was this uh, what we call the seasonality house, or a house that somehow grows in size with uh, the season. It's a very short, uh, very small <coughs> cell during winter, uh, economic, but then in, in, uh, uh, in summer it, it expands and it becomes this much larger thing. And as you can see uh, in this model, it's, it's very close. Uh, <laughs> to uh, Lacaton Rosales building from 1992. <clears throat> and I mean, we didn't work for them, but we did work a lot with them. So we, we did uh, 
for example, this publication with them, we, we did a, a set of exhibitions uh, and we're also at the moment again, uh, working with them on, on their yeah, maybe last big important book. Um, and they certainly in spirit are, are uh, very close to us. And here, yeah, here we have, you could say a similar transformation, but of course, it's, so it's a smoking for a man, something that was somehow established uh, in fashion in the 19th century, uh, middle of the 19th century. And then Yves Saint Laurent in the 1960s made the first one for a woman. And it's, uh, yeah, similarly close uh, as, let's say, the Mesier Plaza in Dublin and, and the Seagram, maybe, but of course, uh, uh, putting man's clothes on a woman somehow has, has, a, has a, a, a second meaning as well. Um, film example, um, Swimming Pool by Jacques Terret from 1968. And um, the cover that um, I would name in this case is uh, A Bigger Splash from 2015. Um, there is also um, uh, another version in between uh, that was also called The Swimming Pool with Charlotte uh, Rampling. Um, but what I find interesting about um, comparing, that would be the <laughs> picture of the um, Charlotte uh, Rampling new movie. Um, uh, what I find interesting about this pair is that, um, like when I when I looked into into the three movies to kind of bring them back to um, uh, remembering them, I, I realized that actually the stories of the original La Piscine and the Biggest Splash are really very close. Like down to like the individual characters and how they're related and what their role in the in the in the story is but um but still you can watch the a bigger splash without like without being not in the story and being really excited although you know what's most likely going to happen next um and um, I find that uh, quite surprising how you can tell pre really exactly the same story and um, still like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new movie. And then there's another, um, uh, yeah, let's say um, uh, an idea of cover. So we've seen different examples now of, of uh, of covers, which uh, um, I mean, the cover coming maybe from originally from music, but of course, in, in generally in creative um, and, and design practices, there are different ways of doing it. So we we also looked in our uh, earth and then there there's one that we um, would also say is a, is a cover, uh, in, in maybe in two ways. So the German pavilion that we were um, responsible for the design in 2016 for the architectural biennial um, under the title Making Heimat Germany a Rival Country. Um, and um, so, the, um, so there, the two understandings of a cover would be maybe on the one hand, it's the, the visual language that we used in order to, um, in order to um, design the, um, the exhibition which directly um, referred to the way how we understood the, let's say, design intelligence of, um, um, of those neighborhoods that were thematized in the pavilion. Um, where, for example, here you see a, um, I think it's a shop for kites um, in Cidade de Deus in Rio de Janeiro. And um, the, uh, all, the, um, all the science and everything is, is made in a very, in a kind of in a direct and bold way with colors. Um, some, here in this case, it's even hand um, painted, but very often you would also see in that now, if we look uh, to, the, um, to our example, 
um, then uh, we try to use the colors, we try to use the uh, kind of the, the minimal resources, for example, also the um, uh, that you print on colored paper, but you print with a black and white um, uh, printer. Um, and so, so there's a reference and a kind of a covering, but then there's also uh, maybe another thing that I would like to um, point out uh, here on the pavilion, which is the cover as uh, using the existing and then uh, so in this case there's also um, uh, all the all the things we did in the pavilion and all the things that we brought into it um, somehow were uh, were either already there or they were like for example the um, the um, the seating benches were made from the stones that we needed in order to have um, in order to have uh, the, the openings closed again and so on. So this idea of using the existing is also something that we, that maybe could be an understanding of a cover. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, what we, what we notice in the rival cities is that there is somehow a very direct way of doing things. Also here, somehow the paint goes as, as far as probably the brush was able to go or potentially as much as you see from if you're sitting on the porch, um, which somehow also translated in the way the stuff is hung in the pavilion. If there's a corner, well, there's a corner. <clears throat> I mean, we could have done that even better, but what I think is also very interesting about this storefront here, is that there's somehow a very little hierarchy in, in the way um, the boards are structured. Everything somehow has the, the same size, basically. It's, uh, everything is as important to sell as the other thing, um, and everything is filled. Next example is a quick one and quite direct one um, from um, this art piece uh, by uh, Donald Judd. And um, this art piece by Jose Di Vola, um, which obviously is like showing the same shape but made from cardboard. And it's, um, I think, like two things. On the one hand, Judd was always uh, claiming how he's using simple materials. And I think this piece is like, this piece is like really embracing this idea of using uh, simple materials by using even simpler materials. And the second thing that I find quite striking is that it also, sh it really shows the strength of the Judd piece because it works as well, even if in this very simplified version. Like actually humble materials. Also shout out to Ryan for engaging in this conversation with us and throwing a few, few of these covers our way. Uh, an example that I really love is Flowers Sunday Be Morning by Andy Warhol covered by Elaine Sturdevant. And she's amazing because she was basically a female artist who liked to uh, quote unquote repeat works by more uh, famous male peers, which I think is genius in so, so, so many ways. Uh, and to give you a sense of how that worked, Warhol even was lending her originals. So he was very much in on it. And I think it's fascinating to me because very often sitting in lectures, for example, or listening people talk about certain things, I always try to imagine, you know, would I get away with saying those things? Would someone else get away with saying those things? How much does, uh, let's say, someone's authorship or the, someone's image affect the things, the way we're receiving information, taking it in. So I think she was raising such crucial issues with regards to originality and the kind of myth of genius in, in, in many, many ways. Another favorite is David Hammond's um, African-American flag from 1990. I presume you are all familiar with the image on the left side that <laughs> Elena is zooming in now. <laughs> One thing after another. Um, 
But yeah, the the African American flag by David Hammond was done in in uh, ninety, and basically what he's doing is he's replacing the colors with the uh, with the with the colors of Marcus Garvey Marcus Garvey's Pan American flag the, uh, that was first adopted in the nineteen twenties, and I mean it's just powerful in many ways. It speaks by itself. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it raises just many, I think, um, obvious issues in many direct ways, but most importantly, I think it changes, it points towards change and the ability to change and transform. Um, a more recent maybe example is that of the fountain and the project of uh, 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 the, the sculpture, I guess we can call it, of um, of Kara Walker uh, called Fonds Americano. So this was part of the Tate series from 20, I think we wrote 2019, but it's still on actually right now. So it's 2020, uh, so a small error. We're covering their things itself. So now it's from 2019. Yeah, yeah, it's, Damn, it's on for a while. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, it, it's up for another six days. So, or four, I think till February 7th. So if you do get a chance to see it, go see it, unlikely, I guess. But What's fascinating, she, she talks about what her inspiration for it was, and it was basically, I think, a short video that we can show right now. Well, I first saw the Victoria Memorial at uh, Buckingham Palace on the park, I mean, on the, park, on the way to the airport. I saw the monument, I took some quick snapshots, moving snapshots out of the window of the taxi, um, and then forgot about it promptly. <laughs> As, as, as one does with monuments and memorials, I think that there's this very peculiar quality that they have of being completely invisible. The larger they are, in fact, the more they sink into the background. I'm not an actual historian. I'm, I'm not. And what's fascinating, sorry, just briefly, uh, recently this piece was also featured in FK Twigs um song called Don't Judge Me with Hedy One and Fred again. Uh, if, if FK Twigs uh, rendition in a way of it maybe is at the limits of covers, maybe covers isn't the right uh, way of articulating it, but she is, it is actually showing the, the sculpture in a very particular light and in a very particular way that we're not able to, to experience either at the Tate. So we thought it's a nice way, added layer, and then of course with the music and the dancing and all everything else and the lyrics. Uh, that also speak with regards to issues of race and there's really just a very strong call for empathy in the song. So it's a multi-layered sort of thing that we thought also raised interesting questions. And another uh, favorite is um, an installation called Imitation of Wealth by Noah Davis. Noah Davis is the founder of the Underground Museum in, in LA which is in a, in a very traditionally uh, African-American and Latino working class neighborhood. And he, he wasn't able to, to get important, let's say, or, or monumental or yeah, just important artworks from all the kind of big name museums to, to be featured in, the, in this museum because of its location in Big Park. So what he decided to do was to just recreate these iconic art, art, artworks by Duchamp, by Smithson, by, a bunch of other people. Here we're showing the Robert Smith Smithson song. So it's a very powerful attempt to break the, the traditional sort of class and ethnic barriers between higher culture of, uh, of ethnic barriers of higher culture. Really, really powerful. Uh, another favor, also partially because it's uh, less uh, maybe. Uh, it has maybe a little bit of a more decisive or clearer attitude. I think a lot of the covers that we showed were respectful in many ways. And I think this is, is pushing at the limits of this, 
So this is the shoe tree by David Hammond. But if you look closely at what the, where the shoes are hanging on, it's actually the TW, TWU sculpture by Richard Serra. Uh, if you're familiar with this signage of hanging shoes in particular neighborhoods or in particular places, they usually uh, symbolize, for example, boundaries formed by gangs or uh, places where you, what can buy drugs or can symbolize many, many other things. But it's, it's quite a powerful uh, takeover and quite a powerful kind of attitude towards, you know, the quote unquote, uh, world self-regard and self-seriousness, self self-consciousness of the, the so-called uh, high art. There's a, a continuation of it, of this piece where, let me see if I have the actual photo, where David Hammonds is also peeing on the sculpture and subsequently, thank you for the Zoom, <laughs> and subsequently uh, also getting a ticket all while being photographed by his friend in, in front of of the Sarah. So, uh, you know, it's pushing at the boundaries of limits of covers, but covers can also build on top of an existing uh, with an attempt to change the original storyline or point to maybe misleading sort of uh, narratives that are sometimes being presented in the public realm. The next example is a cover that we're including in this uh, talk just because we think it's a very nice, successful one. And it's uh, the cover of Into the Groove uh, by Madonna from 1985 by the band Chicone Youth. Um, uh, by the band Chicone Youth, which is actually uh, Sonic, the Sonic Youth uh, from 1988. <laughs> And then there's uh, uh, another one from uh, from our oeuvre, which we uh, thought of in the um, in this question of covers, uh, which is an office renovation. And you could say it's a very classic kind of uh, interior design uh, job, uh, an office like three thousand uh, square meter uh, to be renovated. And but when we approached it, we thought we should um, we actually had in mind all the offices that were uh, like this office. And we thought if, if maybe 90% of all offices in Germany looks or Western Europe look like this on the left side um, and they all uh, should be renovated now, then um, this is a kind of a material metabolism that uh, we really don't want to imagine. And it's actually a really like as the, uh, the time uh, spans for offices get shorter and shorter and they are renovated more and more often. I mean, in shops, it's even more so, but we um, somehow wanted to think of uh, or finding an approach, a way of dealing with the existing and not to tear everything out and then to replace it with something that then in 10 years and then after that in five years and then in two years maybe has to be replaced again. So uh, the approach was one that we, um, we tried to yeah, approach it in a way that as a cover, even though we didn't uh, uh, touch everything, but we wanted to work with the existing. So there we tried to also um, work with uh, um, elements that, that you would maybe see as um, not so kind of architectural or not so nice, like this, all these structures that are not uh, fitting uh, that are not really tectonic. They are not like the ceiling is not lying on the wall because it's suspend, uh, suspended and so on. Um, and we then came up with the idea of the disillusion office. So the, the idea of a disillusion that the one who is working in the office 
actually has a, a moment where they can see the office from the outside and they can realize that the office is just an office. And so now you have that moment where you can, you can see on the right, this is still the old office. And on the left, you can see uh, the renovation. We had to bring in some new infrastructure, a new uh, staircase. Um, but there are several other moments, but this, this kind of key moment of disillusion where you see the office from the outside in our um, idea would help the, um, the office worker to appreciate the office and, and it allowed us to work with the existing and to um, yeah, somehow make a cover of it. Um, mm -hmm. Here comes two covers that somehow are, let's say, <clears throat> a highlight of, of the everyday. Um, it's Klaus Oldenburg. Um, yeah, who clearly somehow references this as, as uh, the inspiration for his work. Um, and another one by uh, Peter Fischli. Uh, and, Rise, where the object again, an everyday object, is is cast in rubber, um, uh, and in a more more let's say abstract way, somehow makes you think about that. Here is again a cover of ours. Um, this, this is a book. Again, if, if, if you would be German, you would know, know it. Um, uh, Edition Zokamp or Zokamp, the Zokamp Verlag is, is basically the publishing house in, in, in Germany that publishes all texts of bigger weight, let's say. And they have been uh, doing these publications since the 70s. And I mean, in our most recent publication, Migrant Marseille, we don't cover the layout really, but we do use exactly the same uh, paper, um, both for the interior and, and the exterior, simply because it somehow is, let's say, the perfect little book. It opens up fantastically. It's somehow nice to have in your hand. It's not pretentious, but still super nice. And <laughs> kind of uh, coming back to the end, uh, to the beginning, let's say, and the cover, um, here we have Helvetica from 1957, and we have Ayar from 1982. Uh, <clears throat> on first sight, they kind of both look quite identical, uh, um, but as you can see in the cover, I mean, this is, let's say, an ongoing story that started even earlier, <clears throat> but the refinement of type for, for um, specific reasons. So Accidents test from 1898 was really done as a type for uh, doing science. Then when Helvetica, when this, Type basically was refined to become Helvetica. They worked a lot on, on uh, the blacknesses uh, if, if you read it in longer text. So this one is slightly higher and there's a lot of little details that are, that are somehow changed in it. And then again, 1982 for, uh, for, for, for Mostly reasons of bringing it to the screen, and again was somehow transformed. And it's 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 tiny little things that 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 get changed, but still it is in the end a completely different and new work. And again, um, looking at the stool. By Alvarado, by Alvarado, this time E60 instead of 60, meaning four legs instead of uh, three. Um, we have, on the other hand, the Frosta Ikea version of it, which we find is a great example too. And we would say it's a cover 
a very successful cover, let's say, also of the ambition of this chair to be a low cost, readily available chair for everyone, which in a way this did do as well, but still this one is 250 euros, while this one was 15. So, and Alvarado, in the end, actually, they, they, they were the ones that also invented the flat package, um, which IKEA made their, their uh, uh, company on, basically. Um, uh, and here, uh, my favorite cover, <laughs> in terms of music. Uh, which also has an interesting story uh, in regard to the, co uh, the cover, <laughs> the record cover. Um, uh, it's uh, Joy Division's She Lost Control. The cover is done by, by uh, Peter Saville, who actually found this graph of, which shows the light reflections, uh, like uh, what, what the light that a dying star is somehow casting out, radiating. He, radiating. He found that in an encyclopedia and thought, huh, if it's in white, maybe uh, it looks cheap. I, I, I switched the colors. <laughs> and then in this very kind of unknown <clears throat> cover by a Greek band called The Life She Died from 1985, they switched it back. And I think the cover is better than the original. This is the original. And is the color. And I think we're ending again on a musical note. I'm sure the musical ones will be very disputed, just showing you a bunch of things that we have on the table, the Adidas tracksuit that I'm sure you're seeing everywhere. So while uh, we're opening up for discussion, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a lot of both questions and thoughts, and we'd want to hear from your covers too. While you're thinking of questions, feel free to ask them away and or put them in the chat or question uh, tab and Kai can read them out. I want to end on a last one, which I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with. It's a song written by Lionel Richie, in case you didn't know, called um, Easy. And it was, uh, for, it first came out in 76. The, and it actually made it to number one, but the version that we're probably most familiar with is from 92 by a band called Face No More. All right, so we're back here with you. And yeah, here's what you all think. Awesome, thank you so much, that was really wonderful. Um, maybe I can begin just by sharing some thoughts and then if students have questions they would like to ask, please uh, begin to type them in the chat room or um, just simply raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, I, I think a lot about the, the way in which this notion of covering as a technique has been quite um, prevalent among younger practices in the United States. Um, and I think in particular, it, it fell into favor after a really intense 20 year period of like not absolutely not covering no architectural precedents. Everything was really about kind of search for novelty through digital means. And I think once that became commonplace, this idea of architectural precedent actually became rather novel again. And I think um, revisiting 
other works for inspiration became something that um, was again quite quite unique as a way to begin a project. And I think in your work, you've demonstrated quite beautifully the way in which the, the many ways in which in which beginning with an existing work provides uh, a, a place to um, produce tension between the original and the and the new. It gives you something to be in dialogue with. It provides a sense of comfort or discomfort when people are aware of that original. And I think it's, yeah, for many reasons, it's a, it's a very productive technique for design and something that I think, again, is still quite prevalent across um, schools and younger practices in the US now. So I think it's interesting for the students to engage with this topic. Um, I wonder a bit about the different effects that uh, occur upon the original. And you started to touch at this more on the end. You said it could be a respectful cover or even disrespectful. It could change the narrative. It could update the narrative. Um, I think a little bit, I, I'm, I'm happy you showed the Joy Division cover. I was, um, I was also recalling Joy Division covers from Geographer and the Lumineers that I think kind of do a disservice to Joy Division because they don't maintain the kind of uh, spirit or emotion or the sadness of Joy Division's work. I think the cover that you share does do that. So it more or less kind of pays homage rather than turns it into a kind of pop song. Um, I also think about like Tarantino films which are more clever in the way in which they sample references. And in that case, I think those covers perform more for like connoisseurs. Like I don't think your everyday film watcher picks up on the subtleties of Tarantino samples, but I think the musical covers are much more accessible, I would say. I would say co covering is also another way to make work more accessible. Um, so I think given all of those potential effects upon the original, I wonder if there's a particular approach that, I suppose this is a question maybe more directed to something fantastic that the three of you take when it comes to picking up an original, are you always are, are you always imagining you're kind of paying homage and and respecting the original, or are you trying to update the narrative that you find in that original, or is it different um, from project to project? Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Um, I mean, I think um, for me, in the in the case of the office renovation. Um, when we first entered that office building, we we didn't feel we like obviously we didn't feel like wow this is an amazing place we totally have to protect it and save it but we felt like wow this looks awful like I'm, I'm glad that I don't have to come here every day and, and work here and this is the reaction that I think pretty much everybody who enters that building uh, had and I think that's also the reason why um, this firm that is like working in a very innovative field and they're depending on, 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 on um, uh, high profile um, experts to, to, to want to work with them, uh, the problem that they saw in that space because that space uh, just felt very old and very, um, but also not in a, in a nice way, like really old, but in this kind of in-between way old that is uh, the, the unattractive uh, 20 year old old. Um, <laughs> so I think, and I mean, still I feel, uh, yeah, for us, it was just um, kind of like a, a necessity or we, we just felt like um, it's just, you just can't just take it out and, 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 and throw it all, all out just from a from very, um, uh, not aesthetic, but from a just from a very practical uh, point of view, like it's just really unsustainable. And no matter what we would put in, sooner or later, it would like follow the same uh, uh, the same road. And uh, in twenty years, people would be like, "Oh my God, this looks!" Uh, and we have to replace it. So I think uh, for in in that example or in that case, it felt to us really like uh, like. We, we have to, like, there's no other way to, than to work with it. So um, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that we didn't think so much about like our relationship to the, to the space and how much respect uh, or, or um, um, we 
we um, we have for that kind of architecture or that kind of aesthetics, but it just felt like that's it's the only way to um, to go. Um, but of course, like our hope uh, uh, in the way that we redesigned the space uh, uh, and in the way that we introduced this moment of alienation, we felt like maybe people can kind of or yeah, people can get beyond this uh, first uh, feeling and really, although the space is the same and it's just as ugly or nice or whatever it is as it used to be, just get a different um, perspective on it. And that I think that is actually something that I find in some covers or I think most of us have experienced this before that we we find a new uh, piece of music that we really like and only later we learn, oh, this is actually a cover and then we get to know to the original and then maybe we even start listening to the original that we would have never found without the cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with your office project in particular, like the, the, the notion of cover there is quite clever because it's also um, allowing both of those time periods to exist simultaneously and, and there's layering there that then tells a story. I think that's that's what I when I taught um, in Italy. That was one of the things that I appreciated most about a lot of the ruins is that they're not just simply a ruin that uh, represents a particular moment in time, but it's a, it's it has layers there that you can uncover and it tells a story. And I think again, that's what I also appreciate about just the technique of covering because it it suggests that the author had to kind of have an opinion about that original. And I think they're like they're. Um, perception or take on that original somehow influences their their new work and then there exists a dialogue between the old and the new and, and again like I said in your office those things exist side by side which I think is quite beautiful we have a few students that would like to ask question Julia you can unmute yourself and go for it if you'd like hi um so my name is Julia actually Kyle you kind of stole my question <laughs> sorry um, it's okay um, I'm a dancer actually who does, who's done a great deal of dance covers, choreography covers, and my in process in doing that revolves a lot around um, taking the choreographer's original intentions and kind of in um, either intensifying them or communicating in what I think is a clearer way. Um, but I found kind of the, the Hammond's flag very interesting and in this, again, kind of piggyback, piggybacks off of Kyle was saying, is there a duty, I think, at large for covers to improve the original work or the setting that the original work was in. I think that that's very similar to what Kyle asked, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Um, I mean, I guess it's always a question of who, who's, who thinks it's an improvement, no? I mean, I think it, if it's an improvement to the creator, I think that's good enough or yeah I think it's very subjective it's difficult to answer yeah I think so too but um, in the case of the Chicone youth example uh, the story is that um, or as far as what, what we learned is that um, the the members of the band like when they recorded their cover of the song, they each had headphones on uh, only with their, with their own music track, so they couldn't hear the other band members. So clearly the goal was to like make something strange or make something different. And obviously a, be a better precondition to make a perfect piece of music would have been everybody hearing each other. So. I think, like in that case, it was really more an ambition to create something new and to create something different than to make an improved version. Um, and just and the other example that comes to my mind is the is the swimming pool example that when I looked at it um, uh, the other day to remember the the story, I was really surprised to find out that the story is almost one to one the same. So. Um, in that case, uh, you could say it's really like no improvement necessary. Just <laughs> yeah, uh, and it, it's still interesting to to watch. I think what was nice about also or what we tried to do was also be less definitive with 
even limiting what the cover is or can be or should be, but is that really just raising almost like it's a claim to or a desire, I feel, to normalize the idea of covering partially because yeah, I feel definitely. in architecture it's something that's it, it, and it, I find it very ironic that in architecture it's something that's not being talked about or discussed or in a way accepted the way it is in let's say other art forms because actually architecture is a lot more limited than music, is a lot more limited than film, than any of these things. And I think, Kai, when you talked about originality that, that, or references or covers that it would be a recent thing or that for a while that wasn't accepted, you know, I would argue here how much that has to do with perception versus necessarily conception. Because how much can you reinvent the wheel in architecture truly? And I'm not saying original work hasn't been produced, but I'm saying mm, no architect works in a vacuum. And invariably, we are all building, and you know, whether we want to call it, call it cover or go as far as calling it cover, we are all building on each other's work and on both the past and in a way the future is going to build on, you know, what's done today. So I think a lot of it just has to do with what we, how we think of this notion of cover. I think we just wanted to toss that out there and kind of just normalize the idea of it and kind of just just knock that idea that this myth of both originality and, and, and genius a little bit kind of sideways. Yeah, I like I, I like the idea that that there's a goal to normalize it. When you say that, I think about OMA's work, which just endlessly covers and samples, oftentimes Mies and Korb, and but but never once acknowledges that. And that's always been peculiar to me that those covers go unacknowledged and unreferenced. And that that's another way in which it's like it doesn't help to normalize that that's a very um uh very direct action taken in the office during those projects and i've always wondered um yeah how, how that plays out um evelyn you had your hand up next and after evelyn we might have time for just one or two more yeah so um i was just i just had a question about at the start you um you talked about the arguments for creating a cover and one of them is that it increases the chance of a good result. And I was just wondering, do you think that that's because the artist or designer recognizes that the original is already good and that by creating a cover, um, they're looking to like imp either improve it or copy the good parts of it? Um, or is it because the user or the viewer finds comfort in something that they have already seen before and, or maybe is it a mix of it? Come on. Yeah, I mean, I, like we are students, we really try, I mean, I think architecture is somewhat so complex also. There is so, it can be so many different variables. In, in bookmaking, for example, it's much more easy. There is certain standard formats that just make sense on a printing machine. And that's why you use them. And they're good, they're, they're somehow, this is a book you want to read. You want to, it should be that heavy, so you can have it close to your hands. It should, it should open up well. There's, there's certain things that just, where you can somehow make this rather stupidly sounding claim uh, that it, that's a good formula to use. It's, it's financially uh, good, but it's also good for that user. Um, and, um, when we travel with our students, we, we very often have, like, we're very, you could even say anal about um, um, them experiencing spaces and in a way also knowing the measurements of them. Because if you find a space that you think is a very good space, A, I don't think that happens very often. Uh, and then B, you should at least know what, you know, what actually constituted it. Great, uh, Xander and then uh, Rebecca, and then we might have to take time. We'll see how, we'll see where we're at with, at that point. Um, in a similar vein to what you were mentioning about, uh, I think it was uh, MoMA, um, what are some ways to tell a cover from something like stolen? Um, is it is it like a question of perspective or intent? And when we do covers, what are some ways that we can credit and love the original while still building on or above it? 
Yeah, I, th I, did, I do think it has to do with that, with, with acknowledging it and not claiming the original, right? It's a little bit like Luca Guadagino kind of saying, <laughs> it, it's, he's never heard of the swimming pool or something like that, right? It, I think a lot of, I think that the point in a way of the cover is it, it demythicized the, the original a little bit and it kind of just claims that things are built on top of each other. So meaning if you, if you, if you take out this notion of ownership, then I think ideas can travel a lot freer or, or one can acknowledge the kind of traffic of, of ideas a lot freer. And, and I think that traffic in a way happens through communication. I always think in terms of just where does one begin or does someone else, uh, where, do, where do I end, where does she begin? You know what I mean in terms of uh, people influence each other so much every day, especially today where we're constantly being ambushed by information, images, so on and so forth. The, the kind of the fixed boundary of, of let's say, grains of authorship uh, is, is really an illusion. And maybe they've always been, and we can think it back to Picasso or Shakespeare, not me, but some can. <laughs> uh, so I think it, it just has to do with the, this need to claim ownership over certain things. Uh, Rebecca. Okay, hello. Um, so in your five cases for covers, your fifth point was summarizing here, I didn't quite get it all written down, but was that in the end, we are all dead. And <laughs> there's correct. Yes. So just inherently, there's something very nihilistic about that, where there's almost a lack of importance, but clearly the work that people who make covers and who create art and designers who are covering things is important and that work is that has value to it so in terms of your practice and in creating covers in just an artistic way and in a design sense where do you find a balance between almost a lack of importance and importance and originality where does that balance and divide kind of come into the way that you design. Uh, when you say importance, can you just elaborate what you mean with it? Like, I guess maybe like art in design is very important. It's like just in terms of the world, like we need design and arts. It's something that is, I, I don't know how to put it, is important, but <laughs> covers are also a part of that and they fall into that. And your practice is, at least the work that you showed us, is um, built of covers. So there's, there's a sense of with the fifth point in the end, we're all dead, that there's a, a lack of importance yet the work that you do and others who create covers is intrinsically important because of it's, I lose in words here. I would, yeah, I would maybe uh, say the point, I, I guess our point is more to say, as also Anna uh, mentioned, that to kind of normalize or to rather ask the question, what do you use it for? Because maybe it's not so much uh, this question of originality, you know, just for being original or doing the new, maybe we really hold it with the first two quotes which say yeah, who claims originality has no memory because in the end it has been there uh, before and yet it's completely new because if you i don't know do something like you build something then it's completely new because the weather is different now or whatever but it doesn't matter you know it's it's it, the question is what do you use it for do you use it do you, does your design have a different purpose than just being original. And I think that's more what we're interested in. And I can build on that equally, but I don't see the last quote as that I think because I'm from Western Europe. <laughs> but our thresholds are very different. But um, but it just has to do, on the contrary, I think it, I see it as a positive. It's, it's just, if time is short, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to use it towards? And in a way, the claim is like Dylan said, is 
is the, the quest or the, the, yeah, the, just the search of cost for cost of originality a valid purpose in itself or are there kind of grander, more important things that you want to put one's effort towards? Like, is it building this myth of originality or genius or authorship, the, the idea, or is it, you know, making things better, more fun, cooler, so on and so forth? So I think we take it with, like, approach it with joy more than darkness. Yeah, I think we've got time for two. Let's try two more. Um, Lee, you can ask your question now. Hi, um, my question is a little specific comparing to the others. Uh, you guys were just talking about like reinventing like uh, like a, like an original building into another thing, right? And uh, I asked this question because you guys are based in Berlin. What's your opinion on Berkheim? You know the thermal power used to be the thermal power station turning to a clubhouse what's your opinion on that we miss it <laughs> <laughs> um uh, reusing a building um for a different purpose great absolutely necessary um and interestingly um, these like industrial buildings have proven to work extremely well as um, clubs. So um, yeah, it, it's just it, by chance it's a, it's two programs that fit together very well. Like I think it's a it's a very successful example of um, a reuse or or you could say a, a cover. Although. Um, I mean, I think when we when we um, we talked about like renovations earlier, and, and we're, we're talking about if every renovation can be seen, or if we are seeing a renovation per se as a cover, and um, we don't, um, <laughs> uh, because like um, I think in many cases renovations are a complete tear down, demolishing and rebuilding, just not the outer structure but the inside, and that. I wouldn't call that that a cover. So, but in the case of Berkheim, where you can, where also I think mostly things were taken out, and a lot of the original uh, structure and is left. Although there were also like uh, uh, great changes made uh, to the to the building uh, to turn it into a club. A lot of safety measures, especially. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's the question if that is actually a cover or not. Maybe the cover version of Bergen is what we where we went to a few months ago. So basically during the pandemic, the Bergen reopened as an exhibition space. And the nicest part about it in the way is it's the same staff working there. So it's the same bounce bouncers with the same attitudes. And they still cover all cameras on your phone and you still get a bracelet and they're still Badass. <laughs> um, but now they're explaining you art pieces. But then, then they're explaining you art pieces, which they choose their favorite art pieces out of 100 something art pieces to explain to you. So, in a way, the space has been repurposed in, in, in that sense, which is still a nice experience. Last question from Adrian. Hi. So, I really, really liked. Um, this idea of being conscious of where your ideas are coming from. Um, but I, I feel like today, especially like so much in fashion, there's a lot of fear of taking something, especially when it's like historically or culturally charged. Um, and like in a lot of the cases you gave, these were like very major works that are already recognized and then somebody smaller covers them, right? Um, and so the, the respect is clear, the dynamic is really clear. Um, but when somebody with power, but without necessarily a strong understanding covers something, then people get really uncomfortable. So um, in, in terms of questioning um, originality and genius, it seems to be a little bit of a different situation when it's um, things that are like culturally very, very rich um, and have been developed over a long time. So with you guys about that idea and have you, um, I guess, become comfortable with the idea of reference and things like that? Sorry, you're breaking up. Can you just read like this last part? You, you kind of, we couldn't hear you. 
Yeah, sorry. So um, in terms of, I guess, questioning, um, like, is it okay to question the originality of things that have been developed over such a long time and have such a rich background? And how do we become okay with referencing things like that? Sorry. Um, Do you want to go? No, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think you're bringing up interesting, interesting points, which we hope to explore in a workshop now. But uh, I think what you're touching on is really powerful and important because it, it raises the sort of emotions that are tied into this notion of, you know, course, originality, authenticity, but also the power that we give to these things. And in a way, you know, so when Kyle was talking earlier about architecture and originality, and, and you know, you used an amazing example, but in many other things, I think we as audience were also trained to seek these things and to see those things. So there's also a lot of just perception and projection happening there. And I think these sort of ethical issues that, become, that arise from it, I find those very important because it says, you know, it goes in a way, it says that the act of creation in whatever form has deeper implications beside just the presence of that object, right? There's a, maybe a, a certain level of ethics in, involved and, and that we're all responsible for. And I think that's kind of like a deeper meaning or layered meaning of this notion of, let's say, covering or authenticity, originality, so on and so forth, to slightly different things. But, I think there's an implication that it's it's not just what you do, but also how you do it. And, and in a way, I think that's where the, yeah, just the deeper meaning or claim lies that there are ways to change. There are, we, we are able to change the way we're looking at the world. We are able to change the kind of, to maybe take down certain people from a certain pedestals or a certain, you know, just, demythicize uh, authorship and demythicize creative processes and so on and so forth. I think what you're bringing up there are absolutely vital issues uh, of, of, uh, of just messed up power dynamics, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's like, it's the beauty of these side effects of these kind of bigger claims that this notion of cover can can bring to surface that we're ultimately interested in, right? Great, thank you everyone for asking questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. I'll, I'll copy the questions that were in the chat room and pass them to our guests to be answered later. We'll give them some homework. Um, maybe before thanking the guests, um, just uh, would like to ask you to say a little bit about how the four of you came together to form this kind of temporary collaboration to run the workshop and maybe give us a little bit of a sneak peek um, regarding what the students are in for for the next few weeks. Well, we go way back. Elena and I worked together for the first time at Rex in 2006 when OMA turned, when Rex turned, OMA turned into Rex, kind of a cover maybe it sounds. <laughs> a re, a re, 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 reassembly. It's kind of like a jazz when bands just reassemble or musicians reassemble. They're different. So anyway, and these two were already kind of entirely hooked up uh, and we're, there's a pandemic, so we also happen to be in a bubble and we're out of the same office space and spend a lot of time together. So it kind of came probably over food or lunch or something like that in a rather organic way. Probably one of the easiest uh, way of going about it. But I don't know if you want to speak to that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I, uh, no. Yeah, I mean, I think like thinking about the, the, the weeks to come, I think we also kind of forced ourselves not to think so much about what might uh, come out of this because we felt like it would be really nice to, to discover uh, whatever there is to be discovered um, together and parallel with everybody um, who is taking part in, in the workshop. So I think we're really like, we're, we're definitely open to be uh, surprised in, in any way or like really also eager to 
learn uh, more because we we are basically we just started we just started looking into covers and um, yeah I think we're 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 very excited uh, about to see what we're gonna find out. Um, yeah, but very concretely, we yeah. were thinking that actually we, um, from tomorrow on, we will continue this, this collection to start with, um, together, let's say, building on it, um, finding covers, and then explaining them to us. Um, and then the second phase, uh, trying to actually cover um, housing floor plans. Um, and um, we'll have a set of quite simple one floor apartments or houses that uh, we would like to explore with you together. Uh, and uh, first looking at the original and then trying to cover it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really great. Uh, also, yeah, thanks for experimenting with the format. I think it was well executed. So congratulations for taking the risk and, <laughs> and uh, giving us something else to shoot for with our upcoming lectures in terms of new standards. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you again starting tomorrow for um, the students that are in the workshop and we'll send them the, the Zoom link for um, that first meeting tomorrow morning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Um, if you like, uh, we have one last uh, outro. Uh, oh, yeah, do it. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. And you, you can just stay tuned. Yeah. Whatever. This will be the reward for everyone that stayed with us throughout.
Good night. Thank you.